Since Dennis mentioned this, I want to just uh, call your attention to the, uh, the, the, this event. It, you know, it's for men and women, so it's uh, something that you'll be going to. And we've got, we've got to get a table of, of people from this, from this group here. But if you just go to KenBoa.org to register and learn about it, um, you, you're on the, it's on the home page. You hit Learn More, and then it'll take you to this uh, description. Um, and then more details when you hit Register Now. And there you have an image uh, of the speakers. It's a f funny thing here. We have Stuart McAllister, who's with us here, will be one of the speakers. And, and his son, Cameron, will also be one. So you have Michael Stewart. So you have two old guys and two young guys. You see there, it's what it has here. So it's, it's really, it's a funny, uh, a funny way to look at it. But we are really, it's symbolic of the fact that we want to be multi-generational. And that's really our intention of doing it. And, uh, it's going to be, a, the schedule is going to be a great fun, though. It's going to be on a whole array of uh, themes that uh, relate to, let me just go back to here just a moment, so you can see uh, the, the, the topics. We're, what we're looking at is identity, hope, and rest. And you know the world doesn't have them. And so it's a matter, how do we find that? And so we call it Behold Your King. And finding those things in a world without them, but, but again, security in the King of Glory, uh, the pre preeminence of our King, King um, our hope, the kindness. So it's going to be a rich time. I'm even going to do a nature walk where I'm going to be showing people how to look at nature. Most people are very are, are not good at doing that. I want to uh, train them in how to, how to do that to look at the beauty of the natural order. I must tell you, I'm getting more and more impressed. I mean, this, these little collections here of images. That, uh, that, that just illustrate the absolute vast diversity and beauty and context of just feathers, for example, here, and uh, these are animal skins. And uh, so on, on the microscopic and on the macroscopic, uh, the midi universe, it's beyond imagination, this bacterial cell. So the more you look at God's handiwork on any order, mag pick anything you want, Zoom in, and you'll find it's pretty impressive. More than impressive, it's mind-boggling, it's dazzling, it's overwhelming. And by doing this, then, I'm seeking to enhance our apprehension and appreciation for the God of all things. These are pollens. You see, we're going to, we're going to do a museum of beauty. I'll have a pollen room, you see? <laughs> Who would have thought it when you looked at pollen? You could seeds, you'd have a whole seeds room. I'm telling you, it's just astonishing because each room has to have break, breaking them down into one after another, one, uh, one sort of a thing after another because these, for example, are reptilian eyes. So these are 25 reptile eyes, you see. Uh, tell me that God doesn't have an amazing creativity and variety when you look and zoom in. What on earth is all this about? You look at this crazy stuff. It's crazy wild that that's an eye. You can't even imagine it. So you see his, his fecundity, his creativity, his play, his majesty. And I am, as I was saying before, finding nature to be a force multiplier in my apprehension and appreciation of God. And remember how Tozer put it at the beginning of his book, In the Knowledge of the Holy? He said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Well, how can I amplify what comes into my mind when I think about God? Well, that's a great way. Start with the visible, the beauty of the visible world that he approaches you, and then use that to point beyond itself to the mind of the maker, you see. So we already have it in front of us, and we often fail to notice. So your task is to become an increasingly astute and acute viewer of the world around you and to use it for praise and worship. And God will say, I'm glad you noticed effectively because most never notice the gratuitous beauty of the living God. When we were together last time, we, we talked about the immutability of God and we talked about how that has huge impl implication for the fact that because he does not change, therefore, you can be confident that you have an anchor for your soul, a hope that's both sure and steadfast. Because you are realizing that God cannot lie, he cannot change himself. When he, God is being true, he's being himself. Truth is not something he has to obey, it's something that he is. And he is the wellspring 
of all truth. He is the wellspring of all goodness. When God is being good, he's being himself. He cannot be other than good. And when God is beautiful, that is who he is. And so he is the wellspring, the source, the fountainhead of all things that are truly wonderful, all things bright and beautiful, you see, all creatures great and small. He made them all in that, that concept then. But begin to cultivate and curate the seeing eye, and you will be increasingly impressed with the wonders and, uh, of, the, of the one who made you. And in doing so, your confidence becomes stable because as you know, our circumstances are quite mutable. They change all the time. And so you're constantly having to recalibrate in light of changing circumstances. But remember that our call is not to look at our changing circumstances and to view God through that lens, but always rather to view our changing circumstances through the lens of God's unchanging character. Now we have stability. Therefore, you put your hope and confidence in his promises and his character, which never changes, and his promises both will not change. That's where we put our hope. So his, that, that to me is a very comforting uh, truth. We're going to be looking at uh, this chapter on the divine omniscience, and then just on my drive here when I was uh, with Bob, I decided, I think I want to change the order. He has, after omniscience, he has wisdom, but then he goes to omnipotence. I'd rather just put those two together because they're related both in Psalm 139. So I'm going to skip and go from omniscience to omnipotence. And then if we have time, we'll look at wisdom. But the divine omniscience, um, God never learned. He cannot learn. It's a, it's, it's a, these are things that are impossible for me to grasp. I cannot really imagine infinity, eternity. You see, if he did not deign to communicate himself through his revealed word, you would know about his eternal power. You'd know about his, his divine majesty, but you would not really understand his ways. And, and you would not understand the astonishment of his love because this you would not see. You'd see his care and his creativity and his beauty and his wonder, but you would not grasp that the one who holds all things together is the one who actually is the lover of your souls. One who would so love you that he would pursue you, he would woo you, and he would underwrite the cost for your own redemption. You who are a rebel, rebel and, and, and destined then to a Christless eternity, he underwrites the cost of that and his own son, who becomes a man without any diminishment in his deity. So the mystery of the God-man. So he became what he was not so that we could become what we were not. It, it, all, the more you learn about his uh, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, his infinity, eternity, the more astonished that becomes, you see. It should become. So you want to hold this together. He's both dazzling and beyond our imagination on the one hand, but he's also on the other hand in us because the infinite God is also the indwelling God. He's the one who indwells us. He makes his home in you and you are in him and he is in you. So when Jesus said, you and me and I and you, seven words, I'll let you process the implications of that. If you chew on it, it's pretty profound because you are in Christ, that's your position, and he is in you, and that's your practice. And it summarizes the entirety of this spiritual journey. So I go back to wonderful Old Testament texts that often would leverage the wonders of the created order in ways that we have forgotten to do. And he said, as he, spe as he speaks in Isaiah 40, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in the balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from the bucket, and regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. You need to understand the biblical perspective when you read the news. You need to get God's perspective that God is sovereign, 
and we are concerned about what's happening as he himself is. Yet at the same time, you need to always bring the eternal perspective on the temporal arena or you'll wring your hands in despair. Because it's telling us about a God who is sovereign, who knows what he's doing, and is built in, building a story, a fabric that is going to ultimately lead to a wonderful end. It is indeed a divine comedy. It, it began well, it's going to end well. And so all of these are images then of his divine omniscience. And we see that, um, re we realize, I'm just going to be very highly selective here, that God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters. All mind and every mind. All spirit and all spirits. All being and every being. All creaturehood and all creatures every plurality and all pluralities. I, rem I can see him writing this sentence. You know, he says, this is good stuff. I bet he, he couldn't help but notice this is good stuff because he sees, you see the wonderful structure. It's almost like a poetic structure. He has the broad category and then there's the details. He, he, I, I think this gave him pleasure and I tell you it gave God pleasure as well. And he takes pleasure, remember that um, you are most fully yourself when you feel God's pleasure, you see. Remember that idea that, that uh, when, I, when I run, I feel his pleasure? What is it that when you do it, you feel the pleasure of God? The amazing thing is you, you can participate in God's joy and his pleasure. Astonishing stuff. But he goes on to say, All law and every law, all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feeling, all desires, every unuttered secret, interesting thought. Just chew on that one for a minute. All your thoughts, he knows them all. You can't hide from him. And this is either a comforting word or it's a terrifying word depending on your relationship with him. And that's exactly what uh, David does in his meditation in those uh, four stanzas or strophes in Psalm 139. All thrones and dominions, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and in earth, motion, space, Time, death, good, evil, heaven, and hell. And I like, he adds this fact that he's never surprised. You cannot surprise, where did that come from, you see? Or also, gee, I hope that missionary gets there in time. That's not the way of God, you see. That is, we, we project our limitations on a God who has none. And it's, a, and it's very difficult then. If he had not deigned to convey himself, we would not know him. So if, let, me, let me then turn to Psalm 139, and we explore this rich wonder of, again, uh, this psalm, a meditation by one who knew him beautifully and well, a psalm of David. I am astonished that he could write this psalm, this young, young shepherd. <coughs> And you can know he was meditated on the created order of the living God. You know that he's meditated and he's seen uh, the beauty of God's created order and um, it's seen wonders, but he hasn't seen that. But he did see uh, wonderf wonderful things. You and I are privileged to see David had no clue existed. This he could see. See, this is Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. And we could see it with a comet there, with a two-tailed comet, not bad. Um, I wonder if David saw a comet. But this he never saw. But what you're looking at here is Saturn's rings. You know what you're looking at there? That's the Earth. So there's a wonderful photo, the Earth through Saturn's rings. But David knew much, and he saw things we, that we, that we uh, right now, were things he didn't know. Um, I'm going to reorganize all this stuff to where it'll be a lot better. Um, as I was telling my friend Stuart, but this, this, this stuff he, in fact, all this, none of this he knew. Um, gosh, now, going back here, this he could know, this he could know, this he could know. And by looking at that beauty, and as a, as a shepherd under the stars, he was a student of nature and used natural imagery richly, as did the, uh, <clears throat> the prophets themselves to describe and to provide analogies for the wonder, the mystery we call God. So he said, Lord, you have searched me and known me. So he begins, first of all, with a meditation on God's omniscience. You see, you've known me. You know when I sit down, 
and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with my ways. Listen to this even before there's a word of my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before. You see, it's like you've garrisoned me. I'm, I'm in your grip. He says, you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is wonderful, too wonderful for me. It is too high, and I cannot attain to it. So he explores this idea, and he makes these wonderful affirmations, but says, this takes me beyond my grasp, because I'm talking about God's omniscience. There's nothing you can hide, which is a very interesting thought, because remember, he knows all your thoughts, your secret thoughts, the things that we might try to hide from others. And it still amazes me that people would do things um, with uh, knowing that God is there, that they wouldn't dare do if they were with someone. It's an amazing stuff, uh, how we can do that. So, but he is there, and he's, pl he's playing to that aws awesome audience of one, and it makes an enormous difference. But here's another comforting thought, though. He knows you through and through, but he loves you still. The one who knows you best loves you most. And that's a, that's a very comforting thought. You are in his grip because there's no skeleton in the closet. What if he finds this? And often people are afraid. What if they know this about me? Will they accept me? You see, this is not the case with God. He knew you through and through. In fact, he knows things about your motivational structure that are too deep for you to know yet because a lot of the stuff is below like an iceberg. And sometimes he reveals stuff and uh-oh. And you, then he shows, and then when you're ready with that more light, he shows you more. He knows you all the way down. And my point is, that can be an overwhelming thing or it can be a comforting thing. And the comforting thing for me, as I say, is that it tells me that then he knows me through and through and still loves me. And he also knows he has a plan, a purpose for you and for me. And we will not be disappointed. In spite of the pains, and he knows our sorrows and our, angry, uh, and our anger and our sufferings, our bitterness, our disappointments, because many times we use nice words, but really we are angry because something is wrong, terribly wrong has happened, the loss of a loved one or something of that nature, and you realize, why didn't God heal this person or whatever it might happen to be? And though we are acknowledge that he works all things together for good for those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. We, although we acknowledge that he uses them not in isolation, but in concert, he uses them together for good, to accomplish purposes right now that make no sense at all. And many times will not make sense until the other side of eternity, until you see him face them. Some things in this life you do, oh, I get that, I see why that happened. Many things you'll never know. And therefore, I have to leave that in his grip. And one of the things that I find myself doing more and more is to stay in Philippians 4, 6 to 8. Stay there, live there. And in, uh, it, because it tells me then, be anxious for nothing and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving heads, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard or garrison your heart in Christ Jesus, which is an astonishing thought. Anxiety in, peace out, not a bad machine. You could make billions on such a machine. If I had a little, a little box and I said, this is, your, this is your peace machine, you put your hand on this peace and it turns your, your anxieties into peace, what a product. Think about that. Wouldn't you, what would people would give everything they had? Would they not for such a thing? Yet it's available right now. And it is called prayer, and it is called um, lifting up your concerns to him and not carrying any. He said, be anxious for a few things, didn't he? What did he say? Nothing. And by contrast, in everything, by prayer and stuff. What is this telling us? It means then that God knows my hidden thoughts, my concerns, and so forth, but he invites me to lift it up, and here's what I now do more and more. And I've told you this before, but I'm finding I'm practicing it more, and it's really working. And it's this. Any time I discern anxiety, fear, um, uncertainty, bitterness perhaps, anger, uh, depression, disappointment, despair, any of those things, 
Guess what? We're not meant to carry them. You give it back to him, you see. And you give it back to him, and then you'll, you'll take it back again, won't you? You'll t and the interval, what you want to do is by habituation, practice, and training, you want to make that interval longer and longer in between where you take it back and then give it back, you see. You want to make it where it becomes more intuitive that every time you catch yourself to wait, why am I in despair of my soul? Hope in God, and you return it and give it back. You see the point? After a while, and through neuroplasticity even, it's an astonishing thing, training, after a while you become spring-loaded to giving it back. Until after a while, it stays up there almost all the time. And when that happens, what is a burden and a, and a tragedy and a sorrow and a horror to other people is for you a source of trust and of hope and of peace and of gratitude and of contentment. How can you be such a person? The answer is going to be because you've entrusted yourself into the ultimate person who will never let you down. And so as you hold it up there after a while, it doesn't, oh, it's there. I'm aware of it, but when it becomes a burden, I give it back. I want you to be trying that. At Philippians 4, 6. And, uh, and then, and, and then the four, seven, four, six and seven. But then the other thing I want you to do is I want you to also, and I, I feel prompted to share this going off, off script for just a moment, but um, I'll go back. But in Philippians, because I gave this assignment to my Wednesday morning group, and so I'm going to give you uh, the same assignment. So this text here. So first of all, the six and seven I've just given you, the peace of God. But now look at verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, what does he command us to do? This is not a suggestion. So, well, he commands you to chew on him, to think about that, to live there. So you ask yourself this diagnostic question. What does your mind turn to when it's in neutral? Have you ever been able to catch yourself? What was I just thinking about there? I might have been online. I may have been maybe on hold. I may be in uh, traffic. Your mind, what does it go to? And if it doesn't go to the things above, then you're cultivating and curating the wrong content. And that is not life affirming or supporting. And so what you need to do instead is to take these things. I've told you this before. Look at what you see before you. And that is the opposite of the news, the perfect opposite of the news, because the news focuses not what's untrue, but what's on false, not what's unhonorable, but what is dishonorable, not what's right, but what's wrong, not what's pure, but impure, that not lovely, but ugliness of low repute, of shoddiness and things that are worthy of condemnation. That's the news. I'm not saying you're not to be aware of your world, but that awareness should be a source of prayer. But you want to, don't want to dwell there. Where you want to dwell is here. That's a radical claim, and I didn't make it up. So you need to take this more seriously, I think, than you, than you are. And so my exercise for the Wednesday morning group is going to be the same for you. What I want you to do is to take out a three by five card when you go home. Remember those? And take a three by four, and in your own handwriting, write this one verse. In your own handwriting. It's more meaningful that it's in your handwriting. You've owned it by writing it out. You see, there's something tangible about that. Take that card that you've just written out, and you carry it with you wherever you go in the next week. And I want to ask you about it next Friday. So you carry that card with you. And you'll know three points of invitation for sure to use that card when you're suddenly waiting on line, on, the, on, you know, on hold, or secondly, when you're waiting at a traffic light, you see, or in traffic itself, or you are just um, in a process of kind of a modality where th suddenly you just find yourself standing around for a minute. You're, even in an elevator, even in an elevator, pull the card out. You see, any time when you have 
what would normally be mindless activity, even that something like that, you can redeem that activity. And after a while, and here's the key, training, after a while through training, it becomes more habitual for you to chew on these things and less habitual for you to chew on the world because people's world to word ratio isn't good. There's vastly more time in the world than in, in the word, but this is a way of, it's not just the word of God, it is, includes that, but includes these truths that we know are beautiful. And they are really the quality of the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And that is moral excellence. So think about what's excellent is the, is the point. So I returned, that was my little sermonette there. Um, now, so I'm not gonna get near as far as I had hoped. But you know, um, you come prepared. There's always an interesting balanced tension point. I'm prepared, but at the same time, I want to be open to the prompts of the Spirit. We'll get through this material in God's good time, but I don't want to be silly and just do nothing but diversions. But I want you to, going back to this for a moment though, with this God's omniscience, I want you to realize then that this provides something that is so wonderful that you cannot attain to it. It is beyond your grasp. You cannot understand it. And so when I think about this uh, majesty and glory of the living God, then I think about the fact that uh, he uh, cares for us. Um, no forgotten skeleton, as he says in this, in this chapter. So there God, God knows and God cares. He had, then skipping chapter on wisdom, he talks about the omnipotence of God, or rather the, uh, um, yes, the omnipotence, so his omniscience. And again, if we go back to Psalm 139, I'm not sure why he skipped that, because um, and there's another one in between where his omnipresence and he, so in David's meditation, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I can't escape you. If I went to heaven, if I made my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, it's a wonderful poetic image of the moment at which the light of the sun breaks the horizon, moves from there to that. It's the speed of light. That's the wings of the dawn. He says, if I do all of these things, he says, even there you will uh, lead me. So he says, in all these things, I, I, the sea, anywhere, your right hand will lay hold of me. You say, darkness will be overwhel overwhelming, the light will be around me, be night. Darkness is not dark, the night and as bright as the day, they're the light to you. So he says as well, that you're omnipresent, you are everywhere, that there's no place I can escape from you. And then third, he then adds another wonderful thing. Um, his uh, omniscience, and he tells us about how he, you formed my, in, his omnipotence rather, his omnipotence, uh, you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks for you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And as he, as he extols the omnipotence of God, he speaks about how his works are so wonderful that his frame was not hidden from you when he was made in secret. He's speaking about when he was in his mother's womb. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Isn't that a beautiful poetic metaphor? The, the womb being like the depths of the earth in total darkness and obscurity. And he says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Actually, the word can be translated embryo. So he's, he's beholding that. And even in your book, and note, your, were written all the days that were ordained for me, when there, as yet there was not one of them. Think of that. The fact that he knew you and knew the number of your days. And this is a comforting word if we have it, understand it. At the end of the material, he then he talks about uh, the, the righteousness of God. But at the end, though, in, in speaking about the omnipotence of God, um, it is a, a picture then of a God who cares, a God who's beyond us, a God who's magnificent, a God who's majestic. And so he invites us to see, I was gonna do a little thing and I'll do it next week that you're gonna have fun with this thing here. Just a little word about this. Um, I love this guy here. <laughs> says it all. <laughs> That's about as plausible as what we've come up with as well. <laughs> but I, I wanna talk to you about something uh, along that line. So I'll remember it next time. But what, we, what we've got though is this whole idea of the um, um, wisdom and power of God 
So I didn't teach all these things, but I want you to chew on the omniscience of God and the omnipotence of God. And just what are the implications for you as you reflect on those things, you see? It should matter. The fact that God is, knows you through and through, the fact that God is also uh, has all power and he's always present, should just consider the, um, uh, the omnipresence of God. So I can change this then. I don't think I think I will. I'm going to change it to this. Yeah. So watch what we do here. We're going to get the the omnipresence of God, the omniscience. Um, so it's the three omnis, the omni attributes. You see, what are the, what are those implications? What are the implications for you? We'll spend a few minutes. I was telling them about what David knew and how he knew this world well. Um, he knew the skies. He understood the glory of, of God's created order, but not in ways we can see. We, we are privileged to know vastly more, and yet David applied what he knew and saw that the one who did this, when here's the wisdom of God, who could have imagined that this one, you could imagine that he is, he's, the one who made this must be omnipresent, he must be omniscient, he must be omnipotent. But the idea that he's also the one who intimately made him and loved him and determined the days of his life and is one that he can entrust himself. And indeed, what David couldn't have known is more richly described in the New Testament, that the one who made all that also, not only just loves us, but actually woos us and pursues us as the bride of Christ, as his beloved. The concept that he would pursue us, we don't pursue him, but rather he's the one who does the pursuit. And he's the one who provides, and he's the one who protects, and we are his beloved. Who could have guessed that? So it's a rich thought to compare that with this. When you think of the omni attributes of God, how vast he is, and yet how intimate he is as well. So it's, the scriptures invite us to see a, a whole spectrum of his manifest amazement because we see that he's utterly boundlessly transcendent and in a very real sense we can know nothing about him you can't know anything really much about someone who doesn't need to learn anything he doesn't have to learn anything and he doesn't have to be surprised and yet he is rich in delight with his infinitude and in fact in the divine trinity, the communion, the union, the intimacy, the other-centered love that is manifest is so rich and abundant that what we now, then we are really the overflow of that rich abundance as he chose to speak something into being that didn't exist. But the fact is that one, you have to have this thing, he's so vast and great, yet on the other hand, we can know him and he wants to know him, us to know him. So it's an amazing thought when you think about uh, how this, so in meditation then upon this wisdom song and the understanding of the omni attributes of God, it has a vast uh, importance to me because if I really am believe, the more I believe that he really knows me through and through, knows all things through and through, doesn't have to learn. That has a lot to do with my, my confidence, not only in my, the purpose to which I've been called as his beloved child, adopted in his household, but also my confidence of what he's going to bring about in due course in the world, where he raises up kings, he deposes them. And we know that if, if we say, why would you allow this sovereign, a Hitler or anyone, any number, whatever period you wish to choose, anything you want to have, why would he allow this to be the sovereign to rule and reign? What possible good could come out of that? Nebuchadnezzar is an, is an interesting example of that. So how he can use history, though. He raises up kings, deposes them. But wisdom is in his hands and all power and might. And so with that confidence, then, we are more than overcomers, aren't we? Because this is the one. Now think about this, though. The one who is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent also took humanity into himself with undiminished deity. I will let you work that one out. Now, in the days of his flesh, he veiled himself 
from using most of these Omni attributes. I'll, I don't know how he could pull that off. Because in a mysterious way, he was holding the cosmos together even while he was work, walking on the Earth. I want you to process that. It was, he didn't give up. I think I'll stop doing that for a while while I'm on the Earth. He's doing it, but now there's a man in heaven. And so this mystery, this wonder, has became, taken on flesh and manifested himself in space-time history and done so, though, not to come as a king, but as a servant, as a pauper, as one who was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Who could imagine such a thing? So the omni uh, attributes of God only underscore, it seems to me, the vast wonders of the love that would underwrite our salvation because God is, in fact, so just, he will not allow anyone, anything, to get away with it without, without consequence. In other words, God cannot forgive sin. He can forgive sinners, though, because he underwrote the cost of that forgiveness with his own blood. Therefore, it is a moral world, but no one will get away with it. They think they may, they may do that in this life. But at the end of the day, there is payday someday, as one sermon puts it, payday someday. And so um, the concept then that this one is so vast and, and, and beyond our comprehension and so close and intimate is quite striking. Were there any particular thoughts that you wanted to share from your table? I, I, I yapped too much. Well, yes. Just one thing just came to my mind. If God from the very beginning knew the beginning and the end of my life, that was pretty much a straight line. But I look at my life, and it's been a weekly life, going in and out, in and out, in and out. And you, it, when you begin to look at his attributes, how much better it would be if we were kind of flowering along on his line and not ours. Yeah. So he's saying that when he looks back in his life and sees that it's like a, it's a kind of an undulating life, that line is not straight. Um, and it wouldn't, how much better off we would be if we really had walked with him and obeyed him. And here's the important thing, though. You want, you want to do is not regretting the past and, and, and not being defined by the pain of that past. And we've all made terrible blunders. We know that. But at the same time, realizing he can redeem even that. And so instead now, we resolve to move forward. So instead of beating ourselves up, why did I wait so long or whatever, instead thank him for the grace of that understanding that you now have, that moving from here, why would you try to suppose you're going to flourish in disobedience? Hasn't worked yet for you, have it? Has it? How's that working for you? You never, never flourish in disobedience. And you always, always flourish in obedience, although the flourishing may lead to persecution and pain and adversity, but the flourishing, though, is eternal. The hardship is brief. The sufferings of this present time are not even worth being compared with the glory to be re revealed to us 